How's your Bible reading going? If you're doing the 2020 plan with us, uh, we're reading the prophet Zechariah today. And Zechariah, Daniel, Joel, Jeremiah, Haggai, they all fit together. All overlap in timing and in content. And we're almost done the Old Testament. Only Esther, Nehemiah, and Malachi are left. And they all happen at the same time. We'll read those over the next week and a half. So guess what? September 30th, we're in the New Testament. In so many ways, I can't wait. Our reading plan has been following the Bible Recap Podcast. Did you know that on their website, there are actually t-shirts and stickers and buttons celebrating the successful completion of the Old Testament? It's a celebration. You can get yourself a t-shirt that says, I survived the Old Testament on it. Now, if you're not reading with us, you may not understand, but if you are, you probably feel a huge sigh of relief coming. Congratulations, you survived the Old Testament. Now on to the New Testament. Well, whether you've been reading with us or not, would you read the New Testament with us? You can find everything you need on the church website. Start September 30th, Luke 1 and John 1, and on Sunday, October 4th, we'll celebrate Christmas together. You've got a few days to get organized, find the schedule, find the links for the daily podcast, but jump in with us as we go through the New Testament together. The Sunday morning messages from here for the next while will continue to follow the reading plan. That'll add some weekly teaching to what we're reading. Jump into the New Testament with us. Okay, these last few weeks, we've revisited an old teaching series on Nehemiah. By the time we read Nehemiah, we'll be just finishing it on Sunday mornings, but we're only watching four of the original eight sermons, and they're all on the church website if you wanna watch them all. But the four we're looking at will really help you as you read Nehemiah in a week or so. Today we're going to skip ahead and we'll take a look at what happens after they finish rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. We'll look at the spiritual renewal that they passionately committed to. And it gets personal. We even see some real specific commitments in covenant with God. And they promise some real deep life change. Even more, they put teeth to it. They create a document, a new covenant, writing, and signed by everybody, and they even attach a curse to it if they fail. Let's go to that video from early 2017. Have a look at the commitments that they made in their spiritual renewal. Let me ask you this. If God asked you to go to Mexico, What if God came to you and whispered in your ear and you knew absolutely 100% that this was God? Go to Mexico. Would you go? Would you sell everything? Would you drop everything and go? Because I I think some of us absolutely would. There's others that, that, boy, that would be tough. That would be hard. What about even, let's go back simpler. What if you knew that God was speaking to you and saying, I want you to do this? Would we do it? What if if God just said, uh, give that person your jacket? Boy, we're good at justifying that away and thinking of a million reasons why that isn't the best idea, right? What about um, you're, you're out there, you're shoveling your driveway, you're finished, you're exhausted, and you believe God is whispering in your ear, go and shovel your neighbor's driveway. Do we do it? What about out of the blue, God whispers in your, your ear, call some, this person and check on them. I believe God is speaking to us like this all the time. And I think we've really got good at tuning it out or justifying it away or convincing ourselves in our little conversations in our head that that would just be a stupid idea. I've told you before about times in my life where, where I believe God has, has said to me, I want you to give that kid your jacket. And I had my favorite jacket on that I had just got and I walked right by with this little argument going on in my head. Or sitting in the doctor's office, believing 100% that God says to me, go and pray for that person. And you can sit there and not do it and talk myself right out of why that's, why that's dumb, right? Several years ago, I was with uh, my, my senior pastor when I was youth pastor. And they had just finished the new sidewalks in front of our church. And Brent and I went out there after the crew was packing up and they had gone, and we went out to write in the cement. <laughs> Can you relate with that? Well, here's me, the senior pastor and the youth pastor, out on the street, we're writing in the brand new cement. 
And the crew chief had circled back around and caught us. And he chewed us out. I don't think he knew who we were. It was probably a good thing for the church. It was another time when they were uh, putting sidewalk around the church. And they had finished it late on a Wednesday afternoon. And the whole youth group was starting to arrive. And we gathered everybody to go out and put our hands in this. And uh, we were all out there. And some people had done it. Some people had not. And the church janitor came out and caught us. And he was beside himself. And later in conversation, this is what he said, and it stuck with me. I love the kids, but I don't want them in my cement. I thought about that this week as we get into Nehemiah. Because here's a group of people who love God's word. They say they love and follow God, but not in my cement. Does that make sense? What is it like when, when, as much as we love the spiritual truths of the Bible, that when it gets too specific, when it actually means I have to change my life, or I have to change the way I think, or I, it means I have to change the way I relate to my wife and my kids, or the way I spend my money, or the way I do business. Now, wait a minute. You've gone from preaching now to meddling, right? Were you here last week? Last week we saw that they took scriptures seriously. As a whole nation, they took it seriously. And they put action to it and commitment to it. They said, are we going to do this or not? So in chapter 8, the result of hearing the law being read, the, 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 the orator got up front and read, and then they broke into small groups, and somebody led them through unpacking it and understanding it. That was in chapter 8. And then chapter 9, the result of that was obedience and, and actually grief. They woke up to what God was saying. They saw their neglect, and they spent a huge amount of time just confessing before him. Now, we come to chapter 10, and that reading it and confronting God's word, that that gripping their hearts with it, now produced an, a document, an agreement, a covenant between them and God that they all signed their names on. Interesting. Here's what I want you to see this morning. Personal application of God's truth must be the outcome of any spiritual renewal. Last week... Nathan was speaking, and he showed us that they, they pulled out the scripture after a long time of it gathering dust. Almost 200 years, it had been tucked away. They pulled it out, and they were reading, reading the scripture. They were grieving. They were broken. And here's some of the things that Nathan said that they were dealing with. This is what God says. Are we going to actually do something? What are we going to do about it? He said, we can't stay in the same place. I can't live tomorrow like I did yesterday because, because God is God and we need to listen to God and do what he says. This means movement, change, serious adjustments to life. And he said it, it all boils down to this, understanding the heart of God and who he is. When we understand the heart of God and who he is, it changes me. I'm going to add this today. To understand the heart of God and who he is and respond accordingly. Chapter 10, we see this covenant. Let's go there if you have your Bibles. Nehemiah chapter 10. I want to look right at the last verse of chapter 9 just to, to finish off that and make the transition. They had done all this study, all this work, all this grieving, all this confession. And in verse 38 of chapter 9, Because of all of this, we made a firm covenant in writing. On sealed documents are the names of our princes and our Levites and our priests. In chapter 10, I won't read all of it. I'll skip through a little bits here. In verse 1, On the seals of the, were the names of Nehemiah the governor. And then verse 8, The names of the priests and in the names of the Levites, and then in verse 14, the chiefs of the people. So the governor 
Nehemiah was the official representation of the Persian king. Then the priests and the Levites, and then the chiefs of the people, all the, the, the civic leadership. All of the leaders put their names on this, and all their names are there. You can have fun reading through them. I don't need to go there today. But we come to verse 28 in chapter 10. It says, The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who had separated themselves from the people in the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, and get this phrase, all who have knowledge and understanding, join together with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. They actually were so gripped with the truth, with, the, with God's word, with what God was saying and asking. They were so gripped with that that they actually put their agreement with each other to hold true to this. They put it in writing and they signed it and they sealed it. And they, they interestingly, they put a curse onto it. And not, not a curse in the sense that we would think of a curse in that sense, but they invited a form of correction that if we blow this, if we screw this up, then we want God to step in and correct us. We have seen this all the way through the Old Testament. There's lots of covenants that people have made with God all the way up until this point. And when they screw up, God steps in and corrects them as a nation. And it's often really ugly to get their attention, to bring them back to him. And it's in a cycle over and over and over. And as they make these agreements together, that we will do what God asks, they put it into this document, and they put uh, the, the, the conditions on it. Have you ever said to yourself, Lord, or to, to God, whatever it takes, I will follow you. I want to follow you. I want to be your man. So whether it takes striking me down or hitting me with lightning, keep me locked into this. We make a lot of those promises sometimes. And, and a lot of those things are just between you and God. Interesting here that this is very public. This is all of them together. And they're saying to God, if we don't do this, step in and discipline us. We will obey, and you have our, permit, your, our permission to seriously correct this if necessary. So at the end of chapter 9, the people had come to the decision, and now collectively, the nation was going to do something about it. We will covenant. So let's look at this covenant. It starts in chapter, or in chapter 10, verse 29, at the end of 29. It really is that we will observe and do all of the commandments of the Lord, his rules and his statutes. We will observe and do. Simple, right? Observe and do. I can grab hold of that. I can understand that. We've been using the phrase, listen to God and do what he says. It's the same thing. If God is God, and I am not, and you are not, if God is God, then respond appropriately. Listen to what he says and do it. That's simply this covenant that they're making here. But added on to that, in the next verses, there's three really specific things that I want to look at. I'll try to do it really quickly. Three specific things. In their situation, they had been in exile in Babylon for 70 years. They were released from that. Some came back. They started rebuilding. Some stayed there. Some scattered around. But for almost 200 years, they've been broken and scattered as a nation. And, and God says, as they come together here, they, they renew this covenant, we will observe and do. And then there's three very specific things that were so specific to their lives right now. They were things that this nation was way out of whack on. So do all of this, but especially you've got to get these three things. Let's look at those three things. Well, before we do that, let's put ourselves in this picture. What if God said to us today, it's time to renew Time to together get our act together to really follow God well. And I especially want you to look at three things. What would those three things be for us in our culture? Would they be, you've got to deal with your private lives, the secret part, or maybe online stuff. Would he say, 
the way we use our money? Are we hoarding it for the future? Maybe it's business practices, fudging the truth or stretching what's normal or taking shortcuts or the easy way. Maybe it's to do with relationships and peer pressure and integrity or marriages. Their covenant says God is God. When we understand who God is, understand his heart, then listen to God and do what he says. Let's observe and do. And now three very specific things. Here they are. Here's number one. It's in chapter 10, verse 30. We will not give our daughters to the people of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Intermarrying was a huge deal. Not because it was intermarrying. It was because here's God's people who are trying to follow God and make him their highest priority. And they're marrying guys and girls from another culture who didn't follow God. That was a huge deal. We see all the way through here, even in the life of King Solomon, that these relationships only steered them, snared them, trapped them, moved them away from their heart for God. And so here we have one verse that's a summary of pages and pages and pages of teaching. But it's more than that. It's deeper than that. Because you understand that in this culture, uh, I did not have permission to fall in love and decide who I married. It wasn't a nice romantic love story. Parents always decided who you married. So what is this saying? We will not give our sons or our daughters in intermarriage. This is a clear statement, yes, on marriage, but probably even more importantly on how we lead our families. Number one is, this hits home, being faithful at home. In the decisions we make, in the things we talk about, the way we raise our child, the directions our lives are going to go, what are our priorities? To be faithful at home. If we are living all out for God, 100% in, then considering marrying or setting my son or daughter up with someone that is not 100% sold out for God just simply means that maybe I'm not 100% sold out for God because something else is in the way or more important. That's number one, and that hits home right away. Specific thing they needed to deal with is it had to come into their homes what they were dealing with in God's word and this renewal spiritually had to make a difference in their homes. The second thing in the next verse, verse 31. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy them on the Sabbath or on any holy day. And if we forgo the crops in the seventh year, and we will forgo the crops in the seventh year and an exaction of every debt. It doesn't make any sense at all unless you know their laws and their... their their, their history here. They were clearly in the law not allowed to buy or sell with each other on the Sabbath day or any holy day. Business would stop. And for 200 years, they had lived in foreign lands and they had just got lazy with this. And they had actually find, found a neat little loophole that the Bible didn't say you can't buy or sell with a foreigner. It said you can't buy or sell with each other. So they had got into this practice, and God says, number two, the specific thing is the way you do business. Your person, your ways at work has to change. The other part to this was to, to lay the land fallow every seventh year for the whole year. This was a principle that God had given them. And also in that year, all the debts got forgiven. Both of those things make a huge impact in your pocketbook. If you are a businessman or a landowner, or this, this was huge. And so what he was saying was their spiritual commitment had to lead to some serious pra- practice changes in their business, in the way they did work. They had to. They were forced to trust God that they could make more money in the six years than they could by adding the seventh year of farming. That God would look after them. That release all of the debts. And God will take care of you to trust in that sense. We slip into these kind of practices subtly. We don't wake up in the morning saying, I'm going to cut corners. I'm going to cheat somebody today. 
I'm going to defraud the system. But maybe we can slip into these things really simply, baby steps at a time, and then we kind of get stuck in a way of doing business that is not honoring or trusting of God. Maybe we're in a career where you have the opportunity to make money that's plain wrong. We need to have the same heart that they had here and covenant before God that we will only make money in ways that honors God. It required them to trust God and it changed everything at home. It changed everything at work. And the third thing, in verses 32 to 39, I won't read all of those, I'll skip through quickly. Let me read those. 32, we also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly the third part of a shekel for the service of the house of God. That was a temple tax. To keep the house of God, the temple, functioning properly. And then we go down here, it talks about their offerings and their feasts and other offerings and their tithe. In verse 33, and for all the work of the house of our God. In verse 35, we obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of fruit of every tree and also bring them to the house of God. And then our cattle and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks and of our dough and our contributions, all of that comes to the house of God and our tithes. Look at the end, the last phrase in this chapter 10. We will not neglect the house of our God. Not only did this covenant look at obeying God, but it was very specific to being faithful in the home, very specific to being faithful at work, and very specific in being faithful in supporting the church. They committed themselves to tithing the first and the best of everything they got, and to the offerings, and to the, the immediate needs that would come up. They even developed a way of rotating system of carrying the wood and bringing the wood into the temple for their sacrifices. That all of this stuff that God wanted would be done and taken care of. Interesting, though, that if they had just covenanted to only make money in a way that honors God, here they're covenanting in a way to spend their money in a way that honors God. The overall principle is that we'd be committed to God's work, and they agreed to do it in a planned, systematic, cheerful, off-the-top demonstration that God was first in their lives. Okay, there's those three things. They were very specific to this culture and this time and these people and the way they were living their lives. But as I look at that and I read through that this week, boy, I can't help but think that those are pretty applicable today. Because where we are in our lives is not a whole lot different than that. It reminds me of Joshua chapter 24. The people had, had come out of Egypt with the ten plagues and the Red Sea parting, and they had saw God every single day leading them. And, and they still messed up like crazy, and Moses had to keep calling them back. But they get through that. They wander around for 40 years. They finally get to the Jordan River. They cross the Jordan River. They take over Jericho. God does amazing miracles in, in these cities and giving them their land. They get all of that sorted out. They're ready to obtain it and settle in. And Joshua calls them all together. And this is the passage she read. Are we going to serve God or not? And they're like, yes, we are. And he says, you can't. We're going to mess it up. But no, we're going to. And what do they do at the end of that passage? You see it? Then he, he said this. If we're making that decision, then throw away the gods you brought with you out of Egypt. The stuff that you're worshiping in your life that's in front of God, get rid of it. There's action to it. And then they drew up agreements together on paper. They made a covenant together that we, interesting thing here, this one and the one in Nehemiah is a me and God commitment that we do together. 
In Joshua, they covenanted together, they all signed the document, and then they set up those big standing stones. To say, every time you walk past that, you're going to remember. There's accountability to it. They decide, they agree, they covenant, and they hold each other accountable to it. The covenant was between an individual and God, but we see that they're doing this together. They're all signing it. Everyone that had understanding and knowledge agreed that we are doing this together. So here, Nehemiah and 42,000 people get serious about listening to God and doing what he says, and we will do it together. Personal application of God's truth must be the outcome of spiritual renewal. So let me ask you, what specific applications of Scripture might God be poking you about? It's always more difficult to be specific than general. Because a general thing could be, I need to be more faithful in giving to the Lord's work. But that's too general. As I see in this passage, we need to be way more specific than that. What if God whispered in your ear, would you do it? If you're a follower of Jesus and you haven't been baptized, what if you're a follower of Jesus but refuse to talk to somebody in your family. I could go on for an hour of all kinds of things that we ought to be doing. But for some reason, we just kind of slide into not. Nathan read from James last week. I want to look at that in an attempt to wrap this up here. James chapter 1, verse 22, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, it's like a man who looks intently at his face in a mirror and looks at himself and goes away and forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer, forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in what he does. You look in the mirror in the morning and your hair's all over the place. Mine doesn't change much. But you look and your hair's all over the place. You've still got lettuce in your teeth from the night before. You look in the mirror, you go, good, and you take off for the day, right? No, we look in the mirror, we see what's going on, and we make corrections. That's God's word. That's the situation in Nehemiah. But we can't just read and understand and know the word and love the word and spiritual renewal without putting teeth to it. The action part is absolutely necessary. And James continues this same thought. Go to chapter 4, 17, when he says, So, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. That's a strong verse. Personal application of God's truth must be the outcome of any spiritual renewal. Renewal starts with understanding God, God's heart, and who God is. And then listening to God and doing what he says. And don't do it alone. Together. A gray-haired lady... um, who was a longtime member of her church, went to the door one Sunday and said to her pastor, that was a wonderful sermon, just wonderful. Everything you said today applies perfectly to my son. The key to spiritual renewal is not to apply God's truth to the person next to you. It's to apply it personally and specifically and in community, together. Let's pray. Our Father, our Scripture sometimes is very pointed and very clear. So God, when we read something like this, it's so clear how we can apply this to our lives. God, would you do the work of renewal in our hearts? 
Maybe resuscitation. Restoration, regeneration, revision. God, would you do your work in our hearts as we come to your word and we see ourselves. May we just not read it and nod our heads and agree, but God, may we put action to it. That people would see by the way we live our lives at home, at work, in our church, and in our communities, with our neighbors, that they might see that we follow Jesus. Make us more and more like you. God, give us the together part of this. In our church, in our fellowship here, no one does this alone. It's a beautiful picture of this covenant to this whole nation making agreements together to move forward. God, may we hold each other accountable to following you 